Good morning, everyone. You're all very welcome. Thank you for joining with John and I this morning or this afternoon. Um, the service will be available later on this afternoon on YouTube and on uh, dial a service from 6 p.m. Reverend Adam is still on his break, but God willing, he will be back next Sunday when we will have a service of Holy Communion in both churches. Our service today, the 12th Sunday after Trinity, is taken from the Blue Prayer Book Morning Prayer 3. My thanks as always to John for looking after the technology. Later in the service, he will be reading from God's Word and leading us in prayer. So thank you, John, in advance for that. So as we come into God's presence to begin our service, let us still our hearts and minds and give him thanks for all his faithfulness to us. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and also with you. Faithful one whose word is life, come with saving power to free our praise, inspire our prayer, and shape our lives for the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We have come together in Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to seek the forgiveness of all our sins, and to pray for the needs of the world, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth will proclaim your praise. Let us worship the Lord. All praise to his name. We just come now as we acknowledge our sins before God and ask his forgiveness. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We say together, O oh God, our loving Father in heaven, we confess that we have sinned against you. We have broken your commandments. We have often been selfish, and we have not loved you as we should. For these and all our sins, forgive us, we pray, through, Jesus, through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. May the God of love bring us back to himself. Forgive us our sins and assures of his eternal love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The psalm appointed for today, the 12th Sunday after Trinity, is Psalm 34, reading verses 15 to 22. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me out of all my terror. The 
eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to root out the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears them, and delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and will save those whose spirits are crushed. Many are the troubles of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver them out of them all. He will keep safe all their bones, not one of them shall be broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hit, the right, who hit righteousness be punished. The Lord ransoms the life of his servants, and none will perish who trust in him. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me out of all my terror. The Colic for the Twelfth Sunday after Trinity. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray, and to give more than either we desire or deserve. Pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, for giving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask, but through the merits and meditation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now our first hymn is In Christ Alone My Hope Is Found. Let us stand and worship the God in the silence of our hearts because we're not allowed to sing as you know.
Please be seated. We come now to prepare our hearts to hear the word of God. Your word is a lantern to my feet and a light upon our path. O Lord, your word is everlasting. It stands firm forever in the heavens. Let us then receive the word of the Lord. So may the light of your presence shine in our hearts. Our first reading is taken from the letter to Ephesians, which John will kindly read for us now. Thank you, John. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 6, beginning at verse 10. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the oppressors, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day. And having done everything, to stand firm. Stand therefore and fashion, fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness as shoes for your feet. Put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The gospel reading for, t for today is taken from St. John's Gospel, chapter 6, beginning at verse 56. Jesus said to the crowd, Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult, who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before. It is the Spirit that gives light. 
the flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned away and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the one, you are the Holy One of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of all wisdom and understanding, send us your Holy Spirit to prepare our hearts and minds to hear your word. By speaking through the scriptures, help us to understand the way we should live. May your wisdom open our hearts and minds to understand the spiritual war we face and the means with which you have provided for our defence. Amen. Today, John read the final reading in the lectionary series from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. In this passage from chapter 6, we find Paul's final instructions to the believers in Ephesus. He warns them, as followers of Christ, to be, to be spiritually strong, as they will constantly face spiritual warfare, battling not so much against human enemies, but against a more powerful enemy, the devil and all his evil forces. Since the beginning of time, and until Christ comes again, the devil will use all means and opportunities available to him to outsmart God's plan for his people. He appears in scripture as the enemy who opposes God's people from Genesis right through to Revelations. By nature, he is cunning, powerful and evil, a spiritual enemy with an agenda to bring destruction that leads to the downfall of Christians. In 1 Peter 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 8, we read, Be alert of so and be of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. It is vital we recognise that Satan is relentless and wants to destroy us. The Bible makes it clear, as Christians, having put our faith in Jesus, our place in eternity with our Heavenly Father is secure. The devil cannot take that from us, but he will try to make us doubt our faith. He uses fear to make us question our security in Christ and his lies to distort our understanding of God's goodness, which leaves us weak and ineffective followers. But Paul offers us a solution, a way to prepare and overcome all types of attacks from Satan by putting on the armour of God. He encourages us as individual Christians, but also as the body of Christ, united together as the church, to stand strong in the power of Jesus Christ in the midst of our spiritual battles. Throughout his letter to the various churches, Paul describes a Christian life like a spiritual battlefield against the devil and his kingdom, which we cannot overcome in our own strength, but only with the help and support of God's indestructible power. Paul begins in Verse 10, in conclusion, be strong in the Lord, draw your strength from him and be empowered through your union with him and in the power of his boundless might. Paul tells us that the power we get to fight spiritual battles is not our own, it's from God. 
It is given to us the moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ. At that moment, all of God's power and resources, strength and might are given to us. In Ephesians 1 uh, verse 19, Paul tells us that the exceeding greatness of God's power has been given to us who believe, power that is described as mighty strength. As Christians, we constantly face battles, temptations and opposition in our lives, but we are not alone in fighting these battles. When we face spiritual warfare, God empowers us and in his word assures us of victory. Paul, speaking, Paul speaks using the metaphor of a soldier's army to describe how we can obtain that victory. He says, put on the full armour of God, for his precepts are like the splendid army armour of a heavenly armed soldier, so that you may be able to successfully stand up against all the schemes and the strategies and the deceits of the devil. Before going on to talk about the armour of God, we find in verse 11 and again in verse 14, Paul saying that alongside putting on the armour, we are to stand to hold our ground. Normally when soldiers fight a battle, they advance forward to defeat the opposition. So why does Paul tell us to stand when it comes to spiritual battle? Why are we to ask to walk in other areas of our Christian life, but only to stand in times of spiritual warfare? One commentary I read put it this way, and I quote, Jesus won the entire war for us when he died on the cross and rose from the dead. We didn't have to march out to meet the enemy because the enemy is already defeated. The enemy has already been conquered. Thankfully, God didn't tell us to go out and defeat Satan because we could never have done that. God knows that we would be easily defeated. So we're not trying to win this war. We're just trying to survive the battle and hold on to the ground God has given us to defend. Unquote. Yet often as we stand in the strength of Christ, that is when the enemy, the devil, does his best to attack and distract us. But Paul continues with the following advice. Stand therefore, hold your ground, having tightened the belt of truth around your loins, and having put on the breastplate of integrity and of moral rectitude and right standing with God. And having shod your feet in preparation to face the enemy with the firm-footed stability, the promptness and the readiness produced by the good news of the gospel of peace. Lift up over all the covering shield of saving faith upon which you can quench all the flaming missiles of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword that the spirit yields. Paul wrote these words when he was imprisoned in Rome and most likely was chained to a Roman soldier 24 hours a day. When he talks about the armour of God and later on in greater detail, he had a first-hand opportunity to study and understand the purpose of his guard's armour. But having armour is no use unless it is properly worn. If a Roman soldier were to leave behind his breastplate or his boots or his helmet or his shield, his enemies would immediately target the place where he had failed to protect himself. So to be fully protected, he had to wear the complete armour. Similar to the Roman soldiers, the same goes for us. When applying God's armour, one or two pieces isn't enough. As Paul says in verse 13, we are to put on the whole armour of God. Partial armour would leave us dangerously vulnerable. The first piece of armour that Paul describes is the belt of truth. And we are to use it when Satan seeks to deceive us, making us believe lies about God, the world and ourselves. 
In, the ancient Ro in ancient Rome, a soldier's belt was not only kept, not only kept his armor in place, but was wide enough to protect his abdominal organs and to hold his sword ready to be withdrawn when needed. The word, the truth of God's word protects our vital spiritual defenses. Satan will always try to draw us into questioning ourselves. We remember how he quizzed Eve. Did God really say? Likewise, he will try to get us to question our faith, to doubt the integrity of our salvation, along with many other uncertainties he will try to place in our minds. When confronted with doubts, Paul urges us to put on the belt of truth to secure our status as a child of God. Through your renewing our minds, and strengthening our faith by turning to God's word. Through reading and studying the Bible, we are strengthened and empowered to overcome the devil's accusing questions. After we put on the belt of truth, Paul tells us to put on the breastplate of righteousness. As you will see, the breastplate was a piece of strong metal armor that protected the entire chest of a soldier and was designed to protect the most vital organ of his body, the heart. In the Bible, the heart is described as representing our minds, what we think, what we believe, how we act, who we are, all are determined in our hearts. Proverbs 23 verse 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. So how can we obtain the breastplate of righteousness? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 that through Christ we are given the righteousness of God in Christ. So what does the righteousness in Christ mean, of God in Christ mean? One definition I read puts it this way and I quote, it is referring to a person that has been made righteous by trusting and believing that Jesus Christ sacrificed his life for their sins. The only way to get to heaven is to become righteous, and the only way to become righteous is by trusting Christ as our Savior. Unquote. Satan will try to plant disbelief that causes us to question the reality of our faith. When we are engaged in this battle, Putting on the breastplate of righteousness is like putting on a bulletproof vest so that we can resist the bullets of Satan's attack. When we strive to live out our lives as imitators of Christ, we become even more Christ-like and it draws us closer into the righteousness of God, thus avoiding Satan's onslaught. The next piece of armour that Paul advises us to wear are the shoes of the gospel of peace. The Roman military boot was a heavy sandal with a thick sole studded with hollow-headed hobnails. These boots allowed the soldier to stand firmly in battle and to cross safely over every kind of rough terrain. They were one of the most important part of the Roman soldier's equipment. God calls us to walk carefully in a sinful world in which our feet are to lead us to share the gospel of Christ with others. Satan hates it when Christians speak to unbelievers about the gospel of salvation because it advances the kingdom of God and glorifies Christ. Instead of wearing the shoes of the gospel of peace, he would rather that Christians wear barefoot to keep them from venturing out into the world to share the good news of Christ. The Bible tells us the gospel is the power of God, the salvation of everyone who, who believes. This is completely contrary to Satan's thinking and he will do everything in his power to hinder the word of God being shared. In Romans 1 verse 16, the apostle Paul told us to be bold when sharing our faith. He said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the prayer of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first 
and also to the Greek. We move on to the fourth defence we have in our armoury, the shield of faith. Roman shields were large enough to cover the soldier who carried it and almost one third of the person beside him. They were covered on the outside with leather and when soaked in water, they extinguished the flaming arrows from the enemy. The devil constantly seeks to attack us by shooting arrows of doubt, temptation and deception into our hearts and minds. The shield of faith is our confidence and trust in God's promises that acts as our extinguisher against Satan's powerful fiery arrows. The Roman soldier's helmet served to protect the head and to identify the wearer, which was largely the function of the crest. It was a vital piece of armour, as an attack to the head could result in instant death. When we are tempted to doubt our salvation or our worth in God's eyes, Paul calls us to put on the helmet of salvation to protect our minds so the devil is unable to plant evil thoughts in our brains that can harm our walk with God. When we realise we are eternally secure in the Saviour's love, we can enter the battle, confident of the outcome and the sure and certain knowledge of the salvation Christ gained for us through his death and resurrection. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The Roman soldier's sword was, sh was short and was used in quick stabbing action to defeat the enemy. The Bible is our sword for the fight against Satan. We remember when Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, he defeated him by quoting scripture. Paul says we're to wield the sword of the Spirit. Here he calls us to be ready to quote the promises of God has made in his word, to stand firmly against the devil when he comes knocking at the door of our hearts. There is nothing that he can throw at us that cannot be overcome by the word of God. So it is vital if we are to win the battle, that we are sufficiently familiar with the Bible. Paul continues in verse 18, with all prayer and um, petition, pray with specific requests at all times on every occasion and in every season in the spirit. And with this in view, stay alert with all perseverance and petition, interceding in prayer, for all God's people. Perhaps we don't give prayer the credit it deserves as a weapon to use against the devil. But Paul tells it is, an, it is another important element in winning the spiritual battle. Why? Because prayer connects us to the power of God, which is necessary to defeat our spiritual enemies. Paul urges us to be persistent in our prayer life. We are to constantly talk with God about all matters. Nothing is too overwhelming or too trivial to discuss with God. Finally, in verse 19 and 20, Paul highlights the importance of praying for the needs of other believers. When we see our brother or sister were facing problems, we are to come alongside them and help them, keeping them close to God in prayer. In a battle, the heroic soldiers are those who stay and help the wounded get off the battlefield to a safe place. As Christians, we are all in this battle together, which means we must pray for those around us who are being attacked and struggling to keep their faith. In times of difficulty, it is good to know that we watch out for one another, pray for one another. Satan is a destroyer. And his purpose is to create division and separation from God and from each other, which leads to stress, anxiety, anger and hatred. But the gospel of peace brings reconciliation in place of hostility. It replaces selfishness with looking out for others, anger with forgiveness, lies and deception with the truth. The good news of Jesus Christ is as powerful as it ever was. 
The reading from John's Gospel tells us that faith in Christ is the one and only way to reach God. Trusting in Christ as Saviour is the only path to forgiveness of sins and the only passport into his heavenly kingdom. Believe in Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Only Jesus has the words of eternal life. Amen. John will now lead us in our prayers of intercession. Thank you, John. Everlasting God, we come before you in this time of prayer to give you thanks for all you have done for us. We thank you for the beauty of the surrounding Finn Valley. Help us to be aware of your presence, to hear your voice through the cacophony of modern life. Make us always ready to obey and do your will. We pray for your church across the world. Within the Anglican Communion, we pray today for the Church of South America. And within our own diocese, bless Andrew, our bishop. And we pray for the parish of St. Augustine, their rector, the Reverend Nigel Kearns. And we pray for our own rector, Reverend Adam. Bless all those who minister. Give them the strength of the whole armor of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, we pray for the select vestries, for those who serve on diocesan synod, for those who serve on general synod, for those who dedicate their time through the many committees that serve you, Lord, throughout the Church of Ireland. And we thank you for the work that they do, for those who work here and across our parishes, who contribute to the running of the services, for glebe wardens, for church wardens, for those who ensure that our obligations under COVID restrictions are fulfilled, for those who attend either in person or join us online. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, the psalm reminds us that you will save those whose spirits are crushed. Help us to focus on those who have less than we have. For the refugee, for those living in lands where violence, war, oppression are ever present. We pray for the countries of Afghanistan, for those lands in the Middle East, for Yemen, for Ethiopia and South Sudan. Help us to pray constantly for peace. Lord, give to the world leaders and governments the wisdom and the desire to make the right decisions and to work together for the good of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for our families, our friends, our neighbors, for those with whom we work 
and live. Give us a true awareness that we share your world with others, those known to us locally, but also those unknown to us in the global sense. Help us to make our homes welcoming places that reflect our Christian belief. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Mighty God, be close to all who are frightened because they are ill. We assure them that because of the knowledge that you have given to modern medicine, many diseases can be cured. Ailments and symptoms can be alleviated. But we bring before you now, Lord, those who we know are ill. We pray for Isabel McCain, for Jim Riley. And in the quietness of our own hearts, we name those who we know need your healing touch. Bless those we've named with the power of your heal, healing, with the knowledge of your love for them. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Merciful God, we remember and thank you for the lives and the example of those who have died in the faith of Christ those who we have had the privilege of knowing and sharing our lives with them. But be with those who mourn at this time, Lord. Open their minds that they may find hope and the will to carry on despite the heaviness of their hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, we thank you for helping us pray. Deepen our loving so as daily we pray through this coming week. We may do it with love and we may do it with sincerity in the sure and certain knowledge of your loving presence. Merciful Father, accept these our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, John. We shall sum up our prayers by saying together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please stand as we affirm our faith together. Do you believe and trust in God the Father who made the world? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust his son Jesus Christ who redeemed mankind? I believe and trust in him. 
Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God? I believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We come to our final hymn for today's service. O oh, church, arise and put your armour on. into the week ahead let us prepare ourselves to go out as God's people let us say together be with us Lord as we go out into the world may the lips that have sung your praise always speak the truth the, may the ears which have heard your word listen only to what is good and may our lives as well as our worship be always pleasing in your sight for the glory of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We go out into the world to walk in God's light, to rejoice in God's love, and to reflect God's glory. Let us say together, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining with me today, whether here in the church or online. Um, 
Stay safe, take care, and God bless until we meet again.